A warm welcome to everybody, high school students from the Netherlands, Spain, Czech Republic and Croatia, your teachers, your parents, welcome everybody. And welcome to our experts and speakers from the World Food Prize Foundation, Wageningen University and other organizations. My name is Miriam Troost, I'm the coordinator of the Wageningen Youth Institute. Next to me at the desk, I don't know if you already see him, but that's Dennis Vlegels former participant of Wageningen Youth Institute and now studying at Wageningen University. Wageningen Youth Institute is a program of the Wageningen Youth uh, of Wageningen University in collaboration with the World Food Prize Foundation in the United States, aiming to inspire youth in food security issues. So, what will be the program of today? Uh, it's important to know that we will record this session and if you don't want to appear on screen, please uh, put off your video. Um, until a quarter to two, you can enjoy our live talk show. We have some amazing guests. Uh, one of them is Keegan Kautsky from the World Food Prize Foundation. Then we will hear Simon Groot, uh, World Food Prize Laureate in 2019 and also founder of the company East West Seed. And last but not least, we have Linda Klander, recently graduated at Wageningen University and co-founder of Kumasi Drinks. At two o'clock, we will start the roundtable sessions of high school students with experts. And we are already very proud of all of you attending, high school students. So yeah, we, will, uh, we expect a lot. And don't worry, the experts, they, uh, they were really positive about your research already. Um, after the roundtables, we will be back at this plenary room for a wrap up by the president of the executive board of Wageningen University, Mrs. Louise Fresco. And we will hear uh, a wrap up of the United Nations Youth Representative of the Netherlands in Biodiversity and Food, Evie Fetz. Over to Dennis. Yes, uh, thank you, Miriam. So my name is Dennis. I'll be the co-host for today. I study plant sciences, uh, but I participated in the Wageningen Youth Institute in 2018 and won myself a ticket to the United States to participate in the Global Youth Institute. So, uh, from the moment I participated in the Wageningen Youth Institute, I became a Borlaug scholar and I became part of a community with like-minded students from across the world. And this opened up quite some unique opportunities for me and for the other Borlaug scholars. After today, each participant will be a Borlaug scholar and will become part of this community. Now, the Borlaug scholars of Wageningen uh, we'll show you uh, the Wageningen campus in a short video, and they will tell you something about what they have gained from being a Bordeaux scholar. Enjoy. show you around at Wageningen campus. Wageningen University and Research offers 19 bachelor programs in English and in Dutch, hosting over 12,000 students. Wageningen Youth Institute is hosted by Wageningen University and Research in collaboration with the World Food Prize Foundation in the United States. There are numerous other youth institutes all over the world, all aiming at inspiring high school students in food security topics. We are here at the PLUS Ultra 2 building. At the ground floor, you will find the startup community. At Wageningen University, we encourage students to innovate. This building offers space for students and entrepreneurs to meet, exchange ideas and connect. Hi, my name is Dennis and I study plant sciences here at Wageningen University. I participated in the Wageningen Youth Institute in 2018 and won myself a ticket to the United States to participate in the Global Youth Institute. Besides learning about food systems, being a Borlaug scholar has shown me that you can achieve so much when being surrounded by like-minded peers. And I like how Wageningen University allows me to put this knowledge into action. Let me show you the greenhouses. The greenhouses are an important part of the plant science group. I myself have stored a few plants during courses I followed but the greenhouses are mostly used for research. An important research topic here is the development of uh, disease-resistant banana varieties. Hi everyone, my name is Jasmine Dijkstruis and I'm a plant science student at Wageningen University. In 2019, I first joined the Wageningen Youth Institute and being a Borlaug scholar has taught me a lot of things. 
such as how to connect with agricultural scientists and entrepreneurs. What I really like about Burr is that this university offers you a lot of opportunity to develop yourself beyond your own studies. And not to forget, the forest is just around the corner. So if you enjoy the nature as much as I do, this is the place to be. This is the Carillon. This artwork has 18 bells and rings out during special ceremonies such as graduation events. The Carillon was a gift on the occasion of the university's 100th anniversary in 2018. This also marked the first year of the Wageningen Youth Institute. My name is Marloes and I study health and society here at the Burr. I participated in the Wageningen Youth Institute in 2018 and it was an amazing experience. It was so inspiring to share ideas about how to feed the world with other students who all have different solutions for this important problem. The building behind me is Forum. Forum is the first educational building of the new campus of Wageningen University and Research. Did you know that former Queen Beatrix opened this new campus? Forum houses the student library of the university. So whenever exams are coming up, you can find me there. The second educational building of the campus is Orion, which is located over there. Orion contains the largest lecture hall of the university with about 700 seats. I'm Chantel and I'm studying plant sciences here at Wageningen University. Being a Bordeaux scholar has made me connect with students all around the world to discuss global challenges and to find solutions to these problems. There's a lot of things I like about Wageningen, but I really like our green campus. Just walking around here makes me happy. The Bongert is a sports center of the university. Here you can practice all different kinds of sports, from tennis to pole dancing and from frisbee to lacrosse. So if I'm taking a break from solving the world food problem, you can find me here. So, we gave you a quick glimpse of the campus in Wageningen. Once things will settle down in the world, we would really like to invite you to visit us for real. Our first guest got up very early today. He's calling in from Washington DC in the United States. I would like to welcome Mr. Keegan Kautsky. Keegan is the Senior Director of Global Youth Programs and Partnerships at the World Food Prize Foundation. And he has been very supportive to Wageningen Youth Institute, the very first uh, institute in uh, Europe. So Keegan, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much, Miriam. I am excited to be with you today as we tackle some of the toughest problems we face in the world and work together to end hunger and poverty and improve life on our planet. So the quote on the screen is one of my favorite quotes. Food is the moral right of all who are born into this world. How many of you recognize the man who said it? Who's this good looking guy holding the weed? This is Norman Borlaug. He saved more lives than any person who has ever lived. He was a farmer and a scientist, a plant breeder and a pathologist. He's known commonly as the father of the green revolution and it's estimated that he saved over 1 billion lives from starvation with the agricultural discoveries that he made. And for this, in 1970, Dr. Borlaug won the Nobel Peace Prize. But despite his incredible contributions to science and all the advances he'd made in plant breeding, the development of miracle wheat varieties that doubled and tripled agricultural production around the world, he was awarded the prize for saving the lives of a billion people the Nobel Committee didn't focus on his scientific or his agricultural achievement, they recognized his humanitarian impact. And in doing so, they stated where there is hunger and human suffering in the world, there can never be peace. Food has the power to bring about incredible change. And after winning the Nobel Prize, Dr. Borlaug challenged the Nobel Committee to create a new Nobel Prize for food and agriculture a way to recognize the critical work and the solutions that were gonna be needed in the future. So as he looked ahead 50 to 100 years, he saw the challenges of rising populations, of limited resources, new plant and animal and human diseases. And he knew that we needed to elevate these issues and to celebrate the individuals that were working to solve these critical problems around the world. The Nobel Committee told Norm they wouldn't do it. So he took it on himself to create the World Food Prize Foundation. At the World Food Prize, our mission is to elevate innovations and to inspire action to sustainably increase the quality, quantity, and availability of food 
for all. Now, the World Food Prize gives a quarter of a million dollars every year to an individual or a group of people who have made a breakthrough achievement and advanced food security in the world. And we celebrate and elevate those real life heroes all around us who are working every day to end hunger and poverty and improve the nutrition and the health and the quality of life for all people on our planet. We've honored 50 outstanding individuals around the world with this prize. And today, you will be sharing your ideas and solving these problems with an amazing group of experts here at Wageningen University, including two of these incredible heroes, Mr. Simon Groot, the 2019 Laureate from the Netherlands, and Dr. Per Pinstrup Andersen, the 2001 World Food Prize Laureate from Denmark. Now, the World Food Prize Foundation brings together leaders from around the world, the doers and the thinkers who are working to solve the complex problems facing our food systems. And that's why we're here today. You are those doers and thinkers. You are the young innovators and entrepreneurs, the scientists and the problem solvers who are going to lead us in the future and help us reimagine and redesign our food systems, our health systems, our energy systems, our economic and political systems. The conversations that we're having here today at the Wageningen Youth Institute are part of something much bigger something very special. Your research, your recommendations, your ideas are helping shape the global agenda. You are contributing your voices to the United Nations Food Systems Summit that's going to take place later this year. So to better understand the bigger picture this is all a part of, here's a video from Agnes Kalabata, the UN Special Envoy to the UN Food Systems Summit. Food is more than just what we eat. The ways in which we produce, process, and consume food touches every aspect of life on this planet. It is the foundation of our cultures, our economies, and our relationship with the natural world, and has the power to bring us together as families, communities, and nations. Families and children are on the brink of famine. But today's food systems are fragile and unequal. When they fail, there are ripple effects around the world. And the pandemic has impacted the most vulnerable among us. But we know what we need to do to get back on track. We have an opportunity to build back stronger than ever. Transforming our food systems is possible and necessary and we can set a course to make real change for the benefit of all people by bringing together key players from around the world and giving voice to citizens in every country. Because a strong food system means no matter your race, no matter your class, no matter where you live, women and men have equal opportunities to produce and access nutritious food which promotes human health at every step without degrading land and water resources. Significa una agricultura familiar provide us, the community, with stability all year round, every month, every day of the week. Even during a pandemic. We are all connected and we all have a responsibility to act. We must be bold. We must think and act differently. Transforming our food systems is the most powerful action we can take to solve our biggest problems. Because together, we can build a just a resilient world. A just and resilient world. Where no one is left behind. 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 Join us today. Transforming our food systems is possible and necessary and it's the most powerful action that we can take to improve the world. So as we envision future food systems that are healthy, regenerative, and resilient, it's important that we remember a sustainable food system delivers food and nutrition security for all, and does it in a way that doesn't compromise the food security and nutrition for future generations. We know that our food systems are complex, and they encompass and are influenced by so many different dynamic factors, our planet's atmospheric and environmental systems, our local ecosystems and ecology, the social and cultural and economic and political systems of our societies, the behavior and the biological systems of our own species, and so many other factors. This year, 
more than ever with COVID-19, we see just how interconnected these systems are and how very fragile they are. So understanding the complexity and connections in these systems is crucial as we solve the problems we face and create healthier and more resilient systems for the future. And it's especially important as we all work together to achieve the 17 sustainable development goals. These are the goals of our lifetime. And we are the first generation in all of human history with the ability scientifically, technologically, economically, and politically to solve these global challenges once and for all, to achieve zero hunger, to end extreme poverty, to end child and maternal mortality, to improve human nutrition and health, to guarantee access to clean water and sanitation, to end discrimination and achieve equality, and to provide access to education and economic opportunities and a quality life for all people. It is all achievable in our lifetime. These are our goals, and that's why we're here today. By being here, you have already shown that you are a leader, you are a problem solver, you are a hunger fighter, and you're a food systems hero. And later today, you're going to earn another title. You will be recognized as a Borlaug scholar. You are now part of the legacy of Norman Borlaug and of all of the World Food Prize laureates. In the year 2050, as the world's population peaks at around 10 billion people, you will be at the peak of your professional career. Whatever path you choose in life, you are going to be the ones making the decisions that make a difference when it matters most. You will be the CEOs and the scientists, the farmers and the philanthropists, the innovators, the inventors, the engineers, the entrepreneurs who are going to feed the world, protect our planet, improve human health, grow the global economy, strengthen communities, and empower others to achieve their potential. Just like Simon Groot and Per Pinstrup Anderson, like Luis Fresco and Martin Kropp and everyone here today, you have the opportunity to be one of these real life heroes whose hands touch the soil and the hearts of all humankind. So thank you for being here today and for being a part of the solution. Your ideas are shaping the global agenda. Thank you so much, Keegan. Um, it's great to see that we can still connect the different youth institutes from across the world uh, despite the pandemic. Thanks. Uh, so for our next speaker, he is not a stranger to us, uh, Simon Groot from the Netherlands. He won the World Food Prize in 2019, and he is the founder of East West Seed. With his seed company, he empowered millions of smallholder farmers uh, to earn greater income through enhanced veg uh, vegetable production. Um, you've all received a bag of uh, crisps uh, these are made from pumpkin, so enjoy these. Now, uh, well, I will keep the chat. Um, I will keep an eye out for the chat. So please go ahead, Mr. Groot. Feel free to ask him questions. Uh, it was a great moment last year, October, or more than a year ago, that uh, my long work in uh, developing topical vegetable farming was finally recognized uh, with the World Food Prize. And um, this was a great moment. And vegetables have not been uh, on the radar screen of most development uh, organizations in the world. It's an important part of the food sector. And uh, we, above all, it is a great way to fight poverty. That's the lesson I have learned in the past 40 years. And we are relearning that lesson again when we have started to uh, do the same things in Africa, where topical vegetable farming is also an under-recognized uh, uh, sector. And in the five years or so that we have started our Africa vegetable programs in a few selected countries only, we already see the tremendous potential in fighting poverty. Uh, vegetable farming employs millions of people in, in the world and it will increase the, the number of people that are engaged 
in farming in Africa. It's labor intensive. It's, of course, not just a matter of production. It's also a matter of market development. And that is a crucial part of the whole process. Again, that's another lesson that came from our 40 years of doing the same things in tropical Asia. Tropical Asia has millions of people, uh, billions, I should say, really. And uh, of course, it had some other uh, uh, development issues. Uh, the general economy developed quite fast in the last 40 years in Southeast Asia. So the purchasing, purchasing power of the whole population increased, and that always helps to sell uh, and consume more vegetables. So that was a supporting uh, element that uh, we can uh, recognize, and that has explained why uh, the vegetable sector in South, tropical Southeast Asia is now very uh, successful. But we can see the same things starting up in Africa in markets. And primarily, it is the big incentive of farmers making more money. This is the real big thing that African farmers are waiting for. Give me a chance to make some money. Help us to fight our poverty. And I think these are the words of one of my teachers in the long days, the most famous development economist in the world, Jan Timbergen, who was a professor at my old university in Holland. And that was his big lesson. And he wrote books about that 50 years ago. Poverty is our biggest enemy. We have to fight poverty. And with poverty uh, alleviation, there is income. Uh, increase showing up with the farmers and, uh, in, and farmers are also consumers and in, when farmers get more money they will buy food and uh, it is part of the whole effort to improve the world is to get rid of poverty and this is our experience in the past five years in Africa is that vegetable farming is a great tool to fight poverty it's an, a way to see farmers make three, four, five thousand dollars per acre more from vegetable farming. And that is a, a, a huge development, an eye opener for, for uh, hundreds of thousands of small farmers in Africa. But of course, it also takes market development. The vegetables need to be part of the market system. It is the not just the production side, it, it is also the, the marketing side. Uh, what happens to the vegetables? Are there, is there enough purchasing power available in that area? Do, are you producing the right kinds of vegetables? Is the storage of the vegetables okay? Is the transportation system okay? All these elements need to, to be taken into consideration. So it's not just production. It's an integrated system of of science to develop the right uh, technology including better seeds and uh, and then at the same time take a closer look at the weak links in the market systems that need some extra development so we are in the in a, a number of development processes we are in seed development better seeds, we need to develop the farmers, and we need, uh, uh, we need to develop the markets. And all these things need to be looked into to, to create a system that will work and that will create money and that will create the food. And the healthy food, I might say. I mean, that's the, the beauty of vegetables that uh, it adds probably uh, a very essential components to the food systems. And uh, you cannot just live on, on grains alone. It makes uh, a wider range of, of, of healthy foods. And that's part of the vegetable sector. Vegetables are, are healthy foods. So maybe what we are trying to do now, and I know one of our people in Africa has been saying this, we are at the start of a second green revolution. And the second green revolution is the vegetable production. That's 
the first uh, uh, green revolution was wheat and 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 rice primarily these were the two crops that were handled very successfully with with great increases in in yields but we cannot feed the world with just wheat and rice alone we need more crops and we need uh, vegetables that add a very essential component to healthy foods so that's what we are fighting for uh, how to develop the vegetable farming sector of uh, of africa and i think we need all the talent all the, the talents that is interested in that on the marketing side on the science on the science plant science side so we are open for new talents to join us in this big battle to change and double the vegetable farming sector of africa and uh, so i'm glad i can add these words to your mission of developing young people uh, to be become part of a better world that's what we are all here for well thank you very much it was a great pleasure to be with you and i hope to meet some of you in person again when i have the chance to share our experiences with the next generations thank you very much Thanks, Mr. Groot. Um, we still have a few questions from the from the chat. So yes, um, Ella, a participant, uh, she is asking why are tropical vegetables so underappreciated? Well, this the question I think needs uh, more specification. What kind of underappreciation is under recognition? It is maybe because it was always in the shadow of the big major cereal crops uh, that uh, have uh, caught the attention of, of the big development organizations of the world. And of course we need the calories to f feed the world, but we cannot just feed the world with only calorie food. And, uh, uh, I think uh, it is a an, uh, an, an lack of, of imagination and uh, uh, you have to, of course, we chose to concentrate on this one uh, crop area. Uh, you cannot do everything and uh, the rice and the, and the wheat are part of the big international systems and uh, vegetables have not been part of that uh, unfortunately so far <coughs> so it's time for a change let's get the vegetables back on the on the agenda yes and, i think uh, so too uh, mr Groot. i will do uh, one last question if you don't mind um mm -hmm. so we have a question from alec uh, what points or um uh, yeah, what points need some work in Europe relating to vegetables? Well, Europe is completely uh, full with vegetables. We have the most sophisticated production systems. We have the best vegetable farming farmers. Uh, we have the best technology. There is no problem here. Euro Europe is completely uh, uh, filled with highly competent uh, vegetable farming industry especially holland of course which with, with, with its uh, greenhouse farming uh, africa is still and um, will remain mostly open fields farming so it's a bit different from holland but uh, uh, I think uh, there's not that many problems in Holland. We can, of course, try to imp improve yields and uh, and uh, nutritional content. That is very valuable. But there is no real Holland is doing well, and uh, and, and Europe in general is doing well with a very competent vegetable. Holland needs eat, to eat more vegetables. It's more a process of education. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's consumer problems. Get the people to eat more vegetables. That's the problem here. 
Okay, thanks, uh, Mr. Groot. Thank you so much for taking your time to answer these questions. Um, I believe uh, the participants are very happy with that. Uh, so now um, I want to switch back to Mirjam. Uh, but thank you very much, Mr. Groot, uh, for your inspiring story. Yeah, thank you very much. I agree with uh, Dennis and I also agree with you. We should all eat more vegetables. So everybody listening in, uh, eat more vegetables. Um, yeah, personally, I really admire your work also, what you've done in Asia and now extending to Africa. And um, I hope all high school students that you get inspired by this. And maybe it will give you a, a, an idea on maybe on your career uh, uh, choice. Um, so we will go, go further to our next guest. Uh, at our table, we have Linda Klander. Linda has, uh, is, has recently graduated at Wageningen University and she started her own business. She co-founded Kumasi Drinks. She will tell you all about it. And um, we would like to invite you once more to pose all your questions in the chat because we have some, quite some time with her to do some questions and answers. Um, yeah, she will explain to you. You, you received all the box and uh, she will show it to us. Uh, Linda, very nice to have you here. And um, yeah, go on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's great to be uh, present here today and talk about the future of food. Um, so I'm Linda and I studied at Wageningen University in research. I focused on development economics and on how you can quantify impact. So I believe that uh, you, when trying to make impact, it's extremely important that you know what you're doing, that you also can measure it. Um, but I started in a very different field and I think especially for the audience today, it's nice to know what is the background of someone. So I started my bachelor in international relations and organization and Arabic, which is completely different than, of course, food science and uh, focus on, on food uh, production. But after my bachelor, I thought, OK, I really want to contribute something to this world. And what is extremely important, that's the food that we eat. And that is the systems in which we live and the systems in which we consume. So therefore, I started studying at the Wageningen University and research. I focused on cocoa, on which I will tell you a little bit more in a bit. And I also focused on consumer patterns. It's really important to know why we eat what we eat and also where our food is coming from. And I believe there's still a lot to gain when it comes to uh, knowledge and consumer knowledge on the products that we produce. So before I will tell you a little bit more about my company, I will tell you something about the Rebel Box. And if I'm correct, all participants received the box, which is called the Rebel Box. And I will show you some of the products that I put into this box um, and why these are such special products. So the Rebel Box is something that I do as a passion. I believe that by telling and showing products that are making a change in this world, that it becomes more tangible for consumers to see what change is. And therefore, I'm going to talk you through some of the rebellious products that I put in this box. So first of all, within this box, you all received this list and the little cards. These cards tell the stories of the products, but we also put some other ideas to make easy changes within your life to make a positive impact on the world. So which products did we include and why did we include them? First of all, there's the unwaste soap. I'm not sure if you already tried it. It smells delicious, but it is made out of a waste product of coffee and orange peel. So when you drink a coffee, I'm not sure if, if you like coffee, but if you drink coffee, you know that there's this pulp that, that's left after drinking your coffee. What they did at Unwaste is that they made a soap out of it. I think this is a genius idea and it's a nice way of thinking about what we do with rest products at the end of a supply chain. Next to that, there's this little bag. And with this bag, you can wash your, you can do your laundry, you can wash your clothes because these are wash nuts. You can use it three times. What you do is you just put it between your laundry and you can wash your clothes with it. If you wanted to have a nice smell as well, I would suggest to put a little bit of perfume because the smell of these nuts, I'm not sure if you smell it, are not the best, but hey, it's better for, better for nature, better for the environment. Next to that, we have tea. It's Wilderland tea and this is made out of weeds. It's a Dutch product and uh, it started by two other students who thought about why are we getting our tea 
uh, often from, from far, far away countries, although we have really, really tasty wheats in the Netherlands as well. So they made a tea out of it. Next to that, there are, there's date coffee. That's this one, which has a very inspiring story, I believe, because it's started by a Syrian refugee couple. Uh, who came to the Netherlands uh, due to the war in Syria. And uh, while they were, were staying here in the Netherlands, they thought of this beautiful product, which is made out of the, the seeds of the dates. So they upcycle the seeds of the dates into this coffee. It's delicious. And then there is the, the Right Origins chocolate. I love chocolate. We'll tell you a little bit more about it in a minute. Um, but why is it special and why is it in your rebel box? That is because it's made by, been made by and for farmers in India. And uh, most of all the uh, profits made of this bar go to farmers, which is not normal within the cocoa supply chain. And then last but definitely not least are the Kumasi drinks. There are these. So this is my company. It's called um, Kumasi Drinks, and we have a Kumasi Sapi, which is a cocoa juice, and a Kumasi Gassi, which is a cocoa soda. And what do we do is that within the cocoa supply chain, there is the cocoa fruit. And the cocoa fruit consists of the, the famous chocolate beans, the cocoa beans, out of which we make our chocolate bars, just like this one. But around these beans, there is pulp. And the weird thing about this pulp is that so far it was not used and not produced. There was nothing was done with it within West Africa, uh, just because the big industry had the demand for the, the, the cocoa beans only, but not for the pulp. So what happened, 80% of all the pulp was thrown away by cocoa farmers. At Kumasi Drinks, we thought this doesn't make sense. Um, in West Africa, where most of our cocoa comes from, Farmers live in severe poverty. Um, and knowing that there's still a product very easily, which can be very easily extracted from during the cocoa uh, production process, which is not used at this point in time, we thought this doesn't make sense at all. So we thought of a way to come up with a product out of this delicious pulp. And for now, this became our Kumasi Sapi and our Kumasi Gassi. And we believe it's really important to rethink supply chains in which we consume and produce, which we are doing by looking at uh, byproducts or waste streams within now the cocoa supply chain, but we're also, we will focus on other supply chains as well. And to give you a little bit of an idea of how that works, uh, I have an animation which will be shown. This now. is a cocoa pot. A cocoa pot contains cocoa beans, and around those beans is a white juicy pulp. It's fresh, fruity, and extraordinarily tasty. But the chocolate industry is only interested in the beans, so that delicious pulp gets thrown away. In Ghana alone, every year, about 600 million liters of luscious cocoa fruit juice just flows into the ground. An enormous waste, we believe. And that's why we've turned it into a soft drink, so that the cocoa farmers can earn extra money and the precious juice is not wasted. The fresh cocoa beans surrounded by pulp go into a press. The juice is extracted, and the beans go back to the farmers to dry for the production of chocolate. The farmers receive immediate payment and thus earn not only from their cocoa beans, but also from the pulp, up to 30% extra income. The juice is immediately refrigerated and transported to a factory of our partner in Ghana. The juice is pasteurized and packed airtight. Then it's shipped to the Netherlands where the pure juice is mixed with just water or carbonated water. So without additives. Into the bottle, label on it, and voila, here they are, the Kumasi Sapi and the Kumasi Gassi. So that's our story. And if you tasted them already, I would love to hear something about it in the chat as well. Uh, but I will shortly tell a little bit more about why we're doing what we're doing and on which sustainable development goals we focus after answering hopefully some of your questions. So um, first, there, there are three sustainable development goals that we focus on. One is no poverty. By taking the pulp, we can increase the income of farmers with up to 30% because we're now using product that was previously wasted. So what we do is that we buy the pulp of the cocoa farmers and by, by paying for it, we can increase income uh, quite a lot until up to 30%. 
Next to that, we focus on Sustainable Development Goal 5, which is gender equity. And this is an extremely important point because within cocoa supply chains, female farmers earn even less. So what we do with our programs, we focus on working with at least 50% uh, female farmers to make sure that we also have an eye for the gender gap within cocoa supply chains. And next to that, we focus on Sustainable Development Goal 12, which is called uh, Responsible Consumption and Production. And we do this in two ways. First of all, of course, by using a waste product, we are working on responsible production. But on the other hand, we also really believe in responsible consumption. If there's nobody interested in consuming cocoa juices or cocoa fruit sodas, we don't have a product. So we really also focus on the marketing part and we make documentaries as well as episodes about the cocoa industry to tell more about the importance of the work that we do and the importance for consumers to rethink the way that we consume. Um, so that, that's my story and I would love to answer some questions if there are some questions, Dennis. Yeah, I love your story, Linda, and I also love the Kumasi uh, drinks. I'm really jealous of all the participants I hope I get a rebel <laughs> box myself. These are for you. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, we do have a few questions in the chat. So the first one is from, uh, let me see, uh, Martijn. Are the two sodas now getting popular in Ghana or other cocoa pr producing countries? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, what we do at this point in time is we just launch our products on the Dutch market. We will focus on uh, launching them on the West African market as well. However, we launched our products in the Dutch market. Uh, what you see with the cocoa pulp so far, it, it is consumed by cocoa farmers, definitely. And sometimes uh, a drink is made out of it as well, which is called milka, but that is often mixed with a bit of milk, for instance. Um, but we aim on launching our products on the West African market as well to make sure that, as what Simon already was talking about, that we also focus on uh, entering the market within the producing countries. Thank you so much, Lida. Um, we also have a question from Daniel. It's a pretty long question, actually. Uh, consumer awareness and marketing are indeed essential to create change in our food habits. Uh, what are your greatest the greatest challenges you face in this area and how do you overcome these challenges? Thank you. Um, are, there, there are a few challenges, obviously. One is cocoa drinks. Um, when I say the word cocoa, you probably think chocolate. Well, cocoa drinks, I hope you tasted them, do not taste like chocolate at all. It's a fruit. So with regards to consumer awareness on our product, the first challenge is creating awareness about the fact that we are a fruity product and not a chocolatey chocolate product. So that's also why our entire branding is really focused on looking sweet, looking fruity. Our, our slogan is strangely fruity to really focus on that part and on the fact that we are a, a fruit and a, a juice instead of a chocolate product. Next to that, we are pricey. Um, other products, uh, Coca-Cola, other sodas, they're way cheaper than we are because we want to pay a fair pay to the farmers that we work with. And although a lot of people do want to make differences within their consumer patterns, it is still really difficult to explain why our bottles are maybe two or three, more, three times more expensive than a Coca-Cola or, or other bottles within the supermarket. And we really have to keep on telling our story and keep on telling the importance of paying other sort of prices, uh, other prices to, to farmers within the chain as well. And consequently, unfortunately, then also, of course, our products are more expensive, but we're really proud of the pricing that we have. And we're also, for now, are not adjusting that because this is how we can pay fairer prices to the farmers within our chain. Thank you, Linda. Okay, so uh, just a quick final question, yeah. uh, because I just like your story so much. So uh, David is saying, I like the Kumasi Gassi a lot. However, I was not able to find this product in the local supermarkets. Uh, did you already introduce products uh, to the supermarkets? If yes, uh, were they interested uh, in it? Thank you. Drinks. So that, that's another challenge. Talking about challenges, when you're trying to put a new product on the Dutch market or on any market, it is challenging. 
Um, so at this point in time, you can find our Kumasi Gassi and Sapis within specialty shops and smaller shops and online. And we are working on getting into supermarkets as well. However, uh, our price point is for at this point in time, not interesting for, for supermarkets. They want to earn quite a bit on your products. And therefore our product like this bottle would be around five euros, maybe four fifty five euros within a supermarket, which is not going to work. So we have to work on lowering our prices for the production of the bottles, for instance, but we'll never, ever, ever cut in the prices that we pay to farmers. So before you will find us in the supermarket, it's going to take some time, but hopefully at the end of next year, there's going to be Kumasi at the supermarkets. But for now, you really have to uh, go to our web shop to, to find some of these bottles. Thanks, Linda. Uh, thanks for your story. Uh, then we'll switch to Miriam again. Yes. Well, Linda, thank you so much. You are really a great example of the impact that youth can make. And also everybody watching, I, uh, yeah, I challenge you to, uh, to go into the footsteps of Linda. Not everybody has to do it, but I think, yeah, we've seen some, a, a great story here. Um, what's going to happen next? Well, it's the moment we've been waiting for, maybe. Maybe you've been a little bit nervous for this moment, but uh, we will st soon start the roundtables. Um, we will host four different roundtables and we have some impressive experts. Uh, I will uh, give the list, but uh, don't worry, uh, the, all the experts, they will introduce themselves later in the roundtable. So you hear some more background of the, of the experts. But we have Martin Krop, we have uh, Linda Klanner that we just uh, had the presentation of. Uh, we have Arnold Brecht, Maaike Groot, Orlando Di Ponti, Anneleen Hulshoff, Per Pinstrop Andersen and Evi Vett. Um, there will be also hosts in every round table. That th those are Yasmin, Chantel, Marloes and Imke. They are all university students and they've been helping us this year with uh, the Wageningen Youth Institute. And some of you, uh, some students will already know them because they've been guiding uh, extended essay groups and also the global challenge groups. Um, in a minute, we will direct all of you uh, to your round table. Um, the roundtables will be rec recorded. Uh, don't worry, we will not use any footage without um, um, asking you if we can. But, um, and well, you will be directed now to the roundtables. You can take a, a quick uh, break, a break because at, and we expect you back five to two at your uh, laptop or computer or whatever you're using. Uh, good luck, have fun. Learn from each other, uh, teach the experts some uh, great lessons, and we will meet you back here at uh, 3.30. Make sure you, they will direct you direct from the roundtables to the plen plenary session again, where we will have two more excellent speakers. Mrs. Louise Fresco, our president of the executive board of Wageningen University, and the final wrap-up will be by Avi Fetz. She's the United Nations Youth Representative of Biodiversity and Food for the Netherlands. So good luck, everybody, and I hope you enjoyed our online talk show. Welcome back, everybody. No doubt you've all inspired each other, and I hope you learned a lot today. We are approaching the end of Wageningen Youth Institute 2021, but not before we have two more inspiring speakers for you for a wrap-up and close your remarks. Uh, Avi will later on um, play a Mentimeter uh, game with you. So please already take your telephone and we will, uh, you will see the code shortly, uh, yes, <laughs> at, at the screen. Um, for now, I want to welcome uh, Ms. Louise Fresco, a president of the Executive Board of, of Wageningen University and Research and member of the Council of Advisors of the World Food Prize Foundation. Please go ahead, Ms. Fresco. Thank you very much. And hello, everybody. Um, can you all hear and see me? Is that all right? Yes? Good. Excellent. Well, let me first uh, repeat a few things that Per Pinsip Anderson, Professor Pinsip Anderson, also mentioned. Congratulations. Because the fact that you are here already means something. Something not just for you, but also to me. The fact that you're interested in the subject or subjects that I've been working on all my life really lifts my heart. Because to be frank, I cannot imagine of a more important set of subjects than food, food security, the environment, climate, and the future of our world. 
be it by way of biodiversity or food safety. There are many entry points, many roads, but this is really what the future is about. And in order to sketch that to you, maybe let me say a few words about the me I was when I was your age. Because when I was at um, secondary school and debating what to study, I actually first wanted to be a medical doctor. I wanted definitely to go to countries where people were poor, to Africa, to Asia, to Latin America. Uh, and I thought being a doctor would be the best way. I had read Albert Schweitzer, who had started, you may have heard of him. He was a medical doctor who went to Africa and set up a hospital. And I thought, well, this is the kind of thing to do, make people better. But then slowly it dawned upon me that there is no point in making people better as a doctor if they have no food. And so gradually I shifted my attention to the issue of food. I went to Wageningen. I went to study there and I did tropical agronomy, a lot of things also with plants and soils and water, but also some social sciences. That was and still is the big advantage of Wageningen of having so many different subjects under one roof. And then I went indeed, I went to Africa, I went to Latin America, I went to Asia, I did all these things. But for a long time, I thought about food as something you produce. So I was interested in tons per hectare or kilograms per plant. And I didn't really understand the full complexity of food. And yet today you start with a much better understanding of what food is all about. I, of course, in my studies encountered Norman Borlaug and was, of course, very impressed by his view, his ambition, but also perhaps by something that Keegan only touched upon um, in, in a sideways way. And that is, he was also a very good um, negotiator and a person who brought people together. And I've learned in the course of, of many, many years that it's not enough to know something and to know a subject well, but also it's important to be able to bring people together on a subject. And so your task, in my view, is double. It's to get some real disciplinary scientific knowledge about how plants grow, how people eat, how, do, how they digest their food, how chemistry can help to make food, for example, uh, of better quality and so on. But also to make sure that we build the social and societal acceptance for the kinds of subjects and solutions we are talking about. Because that is very, very important. Today, we live in a society, as you very well know, with lots of social media and, of course, lots of opinions on what the right way for the future is. And like Per Prinsip Anderson, I have a lot of hope for the future. But I also think we have a task to make sure that we try to contribute the evidence and sift out the non-evidence, the prejudices, the confusion, because there is a lot of confusion about what is a healthy diet. Even that is an easy question, but a difficult one to answer. It depends indeed on the situation. It depends on what we know about people, about countries and so on. And this brings me to another dimension that Evie will pick up, I think, later. And that is we are for the first time in the history of the United Nations and hence in the history of all countries, organizing a World Food Systems Summit. Now, the important word here is systems. We've had summits on food security. We know more or less what we mean by food security, namely food that is sustainably produced, that is um, uh, nutritious, that's also safe, and that's also affordable in the sense that people can buy it and that is culturally acceptable. Those five dimensions are very important. But today, this year, probably in September, depending on Corona, we will meet with all the countries in the world and many, many NGOs and many people from the scientific community about what food systems really are. And this is the big difference with when I was a student or when I started in Wageningen is we're not just talking about a little plot of land and um, a few uh, crops on it. No, we're talking about the entire system, as you rightly pointed out yourselves. Even from before the plot of land, there is something, you know, 
a company or farmers themselves who get their seeds out, all kinds of inputs such as fertilizers, the working of the land. And then it goes down to the harvest, to the processing, to making food into food. Because very little of what you harvest from the land can be eaten immediately. And then there's the distribution, especially now that two thirds nearly of the world population live in cities. So the food system is an extremely complex something. It's at the household level. How is food distributed? Is it still true that men eat first? Is it still true that women and children get poor quality cuts, for example? Is it true that, that people are still suffering because the water quality is not good enough? Or, for example, take the current situation of the pandemic. How much has the food system to do with this? And what we think now is that certainly the pressure on land has led to a pressure on natural habitats uh, where some of the host animals for this virus live. And it's that interaction between agriculture and natural habitats that may have provoked one of these uh, outbreaks, the, the pandemic that we see today. So food touches everything. And food systems are going to be the subject of this year. You will hear a lot more about the Food Systems Summit. But what is important is that you will be there also, and your voices will be heard, because you indeed are the generation who will help to solve some of these problems. They're never going to be solved entirely. There are lots of things we need to look at. But particularly as we move on with our knowledge, we are aware of the fact that we stand on the shoulders of others. We need to take the knowledge that we have today, including Norman Borlo's knowledge, correct it, change it, add to it, and move the world forward. And that is really the task that youth has. What young people have is to ask us, the generation way, way ahead of you, uh, ask, you all the, ask us all the critical questions. Have we done the right thing? Can it be done better? And then move that knowledge into the public arena, into a debate with society. Because as I said, there is a lot of confusion about what food is. Um, what is good food, what is healthy food, uh, I think it's very difficult. And if we would ask all of you, we would get different answers. And obviously, there is not just one good answer. But we certainly know, know what bad food is. And we also know how to make sure people get access to food. And especially when they don't get access, what the causes are. But what is really important is that we move forward. And I agree, it is a marvelous period because we have already reached so much since the time I went to university in the 70s and now where we are today. But we're not yet there. And we need a lot more food that's being produced for the next couple of decades. We need a lot more attention to climate, to biodiversity, to risks such as pandemic. And that's all on your plate. You are the ones, hopefully, not all of you, but some of you, that you are the ones who are going to make that possible. And indeed, if you're not going to be a food scientist or an agricultural scientist, please think with us critically about how to move for the future. So for us at Wageningen University, it's extremely important to have people like you to join us, to work with us. And if you don't go to Wageningen, no problem. Go to another good university. Go to Des Moines, Iowa, wherever you want to go, because it's important that we get a new generation of young Norman Borlaugs. And you are the seeds of that. And we as agronomists know seeds need to be nurtured. They need to be nursed. But in the end, something beautiful blooms out of that. So again, I congratulate you. I thank you very much. For us at Wageningen, this is very important. And I'm so grateful to all the speakers and particularly to the support from Keegan and the team in the US that we can make this happen. And that's already the third time that we have a group of you with us. So good luck on your road. Wherever you go, we will, thinking, we will be thinking with you about the future. And don't hesitate to write, to appeal, to say to us what you feel that needs to be said. The dialogue is the most important thing in science. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you so much for your inspiring words. Uh, and thank you so much for being such a strong ambassador of the Wageningen Youth Institute. So to wrap up this afternoon, uh, expert A.V. Vett, who is the United Nations Youth Representative of Biodiversity and Foods, 
uh, she will comment on her experiences during her roundtable session. And we have seen such amazing research done by these young students, and we actually want to do something with this research. Uh, so we want to create a paper and a video that will highlight the most important findings of the students uh, to be brought to the United Nations uh, Food Systems Summit. Uh, and Avi will be present at this summit and she will present your research, which is uh, super exciting. Avi, uh, how did you experience your roundtable session? Yes, thank you, Dennis. And hello, everybody who I haven't met in the roundtable sessions. I really enjoyed the roundtable sessions. I thought the students were inspiring and motivated and very enthusiastic to answer a question which is quite big. How can we feed the population in 2050? It is such a big question. And as Louisa said, it's maybe a little confusing even. There are a lot of, a lot of components in it and there are a lot of problems. And how can we do this? Well, as Dennis said, I am honored to be one of the experts here, but I am also honored to join the Dutch ministry in uh, the Food System Summit. Um, I will be sitting at one of these tables. Wait, can you see my screen? Yes, May I think so. Okay, um, I will be sitting at one of, on one of these tables and representing all of the youth, uh, all of the Dutch youth. And this is the way I looked at your papers, uh, papers as well. I thought about how you see the future. What do you think the future looks like? What are your concerns? What are the problems of our next generations? And what are the possible solutions? And um, um, as Keegan said, you are the doers and the thinkers of the next generation. And as Louisa said, you must be asking the questions to the older population. You can shape the global environment. So I want to know how you think about this. I'm curious. The food system, system is huge and every step in the process counts. So I would like you to invite you to join my Mentimeter. You can put the Mentimeter code in your phone. Uh, the code is on top of the screen, I think. Uh, I think you can see it right now. It's on top of the screen and you can all join it. Because the first question for you that I have is what is an aspect of the food system? It is huge, it is confusing, and it contains all the aspects that you can possibly think of from maybe the farming process, the production process, all the factories involved. How can we produce the food? How can we make the food available for the, for the consumer, but also innovation, vertical farming, I heard in the round table sessions, um, and genetic resources, maybe genetic biodiversity. Those are all parts of the food system. And here I see distribution to be one of the largest, largest answers to this question. Farmers, yeah, farmers are one of the biggest and most important aspects of, con of the food system. Efficiency, soil, Gender, gender is also a big one. Yeah, as you can see, uh, the food system covers all asp aspects of life, which means transformation will be powerful. If there is a way to change the food system, if there's a way to change one aspect of the food system, it will logically flow into the other one and they all contribute to each other. So I really liked your answers. Thank you for that. The next question I have, is specifically for the students. So if you did not com contribute to the global challenge, if you're not a Borlaug student, you shouldn't answer. But how did your solution contribute to the following categories? This isn't a wrong or right answer. So none of, the, none of your answers are uh, graded, but these are the four pillars we saw were quite important. These were the pillars we saw your solutions had an impact on. These are just one of the aspects of the food system, but we really like to see that you that most of your uh, solutions had an impact on all of them, or maybe or three or two of them. And as you can see, you can see the average of all the people. There are already twenty six people who who voted. 
with food waste being the, li the least voted for, but the rest averaging far above a six. So now you can see how you all contributed to the food system and how you all wanted to change. Okay, back to the food system and back to the rest. Who is responsible for chasing, changing the food system? This is, could maybe some, be somewhat of a difficult question because change is individual and change is something we should do with the whole population. But maybe you think some of the bodies are more powerful. Does government policies have more, uh, more body than maybe individual change? Or is it the, the companies that have a lot of uh, pollution or have a lot of say in what we consume? Or do the consumers need to vote with their, with their wallet? If we don't buy any pollutants anymore, then maybe uh, the companies won't make it. So let's see. All right, most of you think the government is powerful, of the government is responsible. And I think that is a good one. If we can make policies top down, if we can make, make the government responsible, then we can change a lot. But as you can see, citizens are a good runner up. Something I wanted to say um, on behalf of your solutions was something I saw regarding the government and citizens. Most of you had a solution that involved education. Education for sexual education, education for farming, education for women. And this was something that was important to you and is important to all of us important to the youth and important to the less fortunate. So I wanted to let you know that I really like that you included education in your solution. And for the last question, it's maybe a big one, but if you had one minute at the Food System Summit, if you could sit there at the table and speak to the large, to the large body, to the United Nations, to all the ministries of the world, what is something you would like to say? Go vegan is the first answer. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it is quite a big, a big question. If you have one minute, that's not a lot of time. But you could say a lot in one minute, I think. For my speech at the food system, I will try to gather as much information and such a place as this, as this is great for it. I will gather all your information. I will look at the paper that will be written and I will look at the video and I will take it and I will take all the information and include it in my speech. So that is something that I, you motivate me to. Use the rain for a lot of gain. Whoa, I like that one. So maybe include like gather the rain in cities. I thought trees were, uh, could be used for that. That's nice. We need to act now. Let's start now. We should start with investing in a lot of more developments. We, sh we should start changing policies to make it accessible. Yeah. All types of food should be available everywhere. Oh, I really like your answers. Teach others about healthy eating habits. Yeah, healthy eating is a very large topic in the food systems as well. But as Louise say, said, what is healthy eating? Quite a difficult question, I think. The future belongs to the young people. Give the youth a voice and a seat at the table. Let the youth lead. Yeah, I think this is a very good one to wrap it up. I wanted to thank you for your innovative, creative and inspiring solutions. Because you are the youth, you are the next generation. You are the next farmers, you are the next plant breeders, you are the scientists, but also the ones who will vote and will make the policies in the future. And to the other experts, politicians and policymakers, I want to say our generation is not only critical, but they're hopeful too. And we hope you share optimism as optimism is essential to change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Evie Vett. Thank you, Louise Fresco, for this excellent wrap-up.
I think we've had a really an interesting afternoon. I've enjoyed it. I hope everybody has enjoyed it. Um, and then it's my time to, to thank all the participants, all the high school students that we've, we've met last year. I think it's been a hell of a ride maybe for some. It's, it's, a, it's a strange year. And um, I'm very proud of all of you. And I'm proud of my student team at Wageningen University who has guided uh, most of your groups uh, with, with your research. And uh, we had some activities together this year. We did the food chain challenge. I recognize, I see all of you on screen now, and I, I, I recognize some of your faces. Some of you were at the food chain ch challenge. Some of you went uh, with us uh, within the Nobel Peace Prize uh, activity that we did with Minnesota, with New Jersey, and with the students from high school students from Sweden. Um, yeah, but anyway, you are all Borlaug scholars now, so you are part of the big World Food Prize family, as I should call it, because it really feels like that. And uh, we will send you a Borlaug certificate of attendance in the coming weeks. Um, so thank you, students. Thank you also, teachers, for supporting your students to participate in a program like this. Um, then I want to thank all our experts and also our technical hosts, my student team. And of course, uh, last but not least, our, uh, our speakers also. It's been, I think it's been an inspiring uh, afternoon and uh, it, might, it might be a start for a lot of you to, to, to start something in, within, this, uh, within this topic, in your career, in your education. So, um, yeah, what, what's next? We, will, we still have to announce uh, the students that we will select to come with us to the Global Youth Institute in Des Moines in uh, October. And um, for that, I, uh, yeah, my co-host Dennis will tell you more about it. Uh, these are my last words to you. Hope to see you in the future. Really enjoyed this year. And um, over to Dennis, but not before I thank him because he's really a great help for the Wageningen Youth Institute. And um, yeah, he will be here, still be at Wageningen University, so he will still be there uh, to, uh, for the coming years. So over to Dennis. Thank you so much, Miriam. Um, yeah, I love to do this, so it's no problem. Um, anyway, we will go Insta Live uh, on Tuesday, the 9th of March, at 12.15 Central uh, European time, to announce the winners of the Wageningen Youth Institute. So please follow us on Instagram, and while you're at it, also follow us on LinkedIn, of course. Um, and please stay in touch, and we'll see you all uh, next Tuesday uh, for the announcement of the winners. So I uh, hope to see you all in the future again. Bye for now. <laughs>